so I probably can squeeze like 12 minutes out of it. <laughs> so your options are say nothing and maybe not have a class, have a class, say nothing, have a class, but only 12 minutes long, and then we just awkwardly stare at each other, or submit questions. So I don't know what you guys want to choose, but that, that one would be the option I would prefer. And it doesn't have to be questions about what we have covered so far. It can be questions about anything with regards to what it means to be a church that belongs to Christ and to run the church the way that Christ would have us run it. Uh, I mean, we're going to be in Acts 16 tonight. Acts 16, at least we're going to start there. And uh, we're going to continue talking about kind of some topical things that come up when we think about what it means and what, what a church ought to look like. And before we read there, I'm, uh, I'm going to have Dylan Adams lead us in an opening prayer. God, we're so glad to be here. We're glad to be a group of imperfect people learning how to be more pleasing to you. Thank you for making your church. We know that we couldn't do it without your people. We couldn't grow and mature and truly be pleasing to you without each other. We need each other. We are weak and sinful and imperfect, and we're thankful that we're surrounded by weak and sinful and imperfect. Help us to realize who we are in light of you and in light of each other. Help us to lean on love and one another, to admit our faults, to learn more about you and how these, this group of broken and perfect people can serve a perfect and holy God. We'll never be able to do so perfectly on this earth, but we look forward to the day where we can do that with you forever in heaven. Help us to learn. Help us to have open minds and hearts and to be challenged. We want to be challenged because we know that's the only way we can grow. And even though it hurts when we're challenged, give us the strength to push through that and to pursue you through our hurt. Thank you for Jonathan and his willingness and his skill set and desire to teach your people about you. Be with his mind and his heart as he always strives to deliver a message that is knowledgeable and pleasing to you. And be with us as we listen. We're all servants of you. May we always act as such. Through the name of Jesus, we pray all this. Amen. 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 All right. Acts 16, beginning in verse 22. This is a story of Paul and Silas when they're in the city of Philippi. It says, The crowd rose up together against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. And when they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. I want to start by asking you guys a question. For those of you who have been to one of our regular worship assemblies, 
If you, uh, if there were a visitor to come into our assembly and you were to say, what was the weirdest thing about our worship? What would they say? No music, no instruments. Somebody would say no music. That's not true. There is music, right? There is music. And no instruments when we worship God. No instruments when we worship God. That is obviously one of the weirdest things about how we operate as a church. We don't use instruments. And... And we don't have a special group of people who are in charge of the music, right? That's the other facet of that. It's not just that we don't use instruments, but what? We don't have a choir. But, but we don't have a choir, right? We all sing together, and that does truly, in American culture, make us odd. And so there's no, there's no avoiding the idea that that makes us peculiar. And so we should ask ourselves the question, why do we do that? Should we do that? Is it acceptable to do otherwise. And so what I want to talk to you about tonight is how we worship, particularly in regard to why we don't, why we choose to not use instruments in our worship. And that's important because in the other ways of worship, we're not very much different from the way that other churches operate, right? Every church prays, every church has sermons, every church does the things we've already talked about, the Lord's Supper and things like that. But this is one question that remains because it does make us odd in our culture. Why, when everybody else is using instruments to worship God, have we chosen not to? And I want to start by saying that I understand that there's probably people in this room who think, why in the world are we talking about this? And why would you guys make an issue out of something like this? And I understand that there's people in the room who may think, I know why they're making an issue out of this, but I don't agree with it. What I want to do tonight is I want to show you in the clearest possible way I can the case, the best case, I think. For why a church should not use instruments in its worship to God. Long ago, as a young man, I wrestled with that question. Why, why do we do this? Why is, it, why is it not okay to do it the way that every other church does it? And my dad answered that question by telling me that really what we need to do is ask ourselves three more questions. Three questions that really will help us see why we worship God the way that we do. And really, uh, I added one more question to the top of it. So I want to give you four questions, four questions to ask yourself that will help us resolve this question of why do we worship the way we do and why we don't use instruments. And the first question is this. This is the one that I added because I think it's really important for setting the tone in this conversation. When it comes to the fact that we don't use instruments, why do people think that's silly? Why do people think that that's peculiar or weird? It is. It obviously is weird, but why? Why do we think that's so strange? Everybody likes music instruments. Okay, every, everybody likes it. It sounds good, right? I mean, if I can get, if I can get a piano with a voice, that, that sounds better than just about anything else in my mind. Yes, sir? Sometimes they're going back to the Old Testament. Okay. And thinking the things that did there. Yeah. Why? Okay, we see we see that in the Old Testament. Why is it not okay for us to use it in the New Testament? Good question. Yeah. It's the same thing. Everybody's doing it. Why not you? Yeah. And I think really, really, what it comes down to for most people is that. This is what everybody does. Why would you question this? Why would you do this differently? Why would you have a problem with it? This is what everybody does. What I want you to appreciate from the beginning is that historically that's just not the case. Is that what we're suffering from is a pretty big case of recency bias. Do you all know what that is? That's a psychological term, right? Recency bias. We are, we are biased because of what we've most recently experienced. The truth is that for about 1,850 years, nobody used instruments in the worship except for the Catholics. And they didn't do it until about 600 AD. In fact, many of those church fathers that, that, that are famous throughout history, many of them would have been opposed to using instruments in the worship of God. People like Martin Luther, who nailed his 95 theses on the door in Wittenberg, would have been opposed to musical, using musical instruments in the worship of God. And so when we think about this and we say, well, this just seems silly, this just seems stupid, why would we worry about this? Because it's so popular right now. Well, for centuries, it wasn't. And for centuries, people thought it was wrong. And so really, if we're looking and we're weighing the popularity of this, 
not using instruments throughout history has been much more popular than using instruments. This is only a very new phenomenon. Now, I don't say that to make the case, well, it's been more popular to not use instruments, so that's why we shouldn't use it. I just, make, I just say that to make the case that no matter how popular it is, that shouldn't dictate why we do what we do. Do you agree with that? Whether everybody in the world does it, that doesn't make it right. Whether nobody in the world does it, that doesn't make it right either. What we need to base our decision on is what the Word of God says. And so that's what we need to think about. Why do we think this is silly? Partially because this is a very new phenomenon and everybody does it, but that hasn't been true through the centuries. That's the one that I added. Now let me tell, let me tell you the three questions my dad told me to ask. Why do we not use instruments in the worship of God? To answer that question, the first question you need to ask yourself is this. Does God care how we worship Him? Does God care how we worship Him? What would you say to that? Yes. Yes? We have anybody who's going to say no. It does not matter how we worship God. He doesn't care one bit. He absolutely does. Go back to the book of Genesis. Let me show you some scripture. We're going to go through a lot of scriptures tonight because I want you to show this that this is biblically founded. And uh, we might run out of time. But if we run out of time because we're reading passages, that's a, uh, that's a mistake I'm willing to make. So Genesis chapter 4, Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Look at this very early Bible story. Genesis 4, 1 through 4. Somebody read that for us. Five, I didn't tell you to, but that was the right thing to do. <laughs> so very, very quickly in the Bible story, this is the first instance you have of worship in the Bible, of people engaging in something that is designed to communicate reverence and respect and obedience to God. And notice that it draws a very clear line that both of these men worship, right? Cain is not, is not condemned because he refused to worship God, is he? Cain offers worship, but what's the problem? Cain does something wrong, and we and people have debated for centuries over what he did wrong. No one really knows what Cain did wrong, but the, the, the point is clear. That God had regard for Abel and his offering, but Cain and his offering, he did not have any regard. And that shows us something, that God cares not just that we worship, but he cares how we worship. Some worship is acceptable to him, and some worship is unacceptable to him. We see this again in Exodus chapter 29. Uh, sorry. Yes, that's right. Exodus chapter 29. Exodus 29 and verse 18. Exodus 29 and verse 18. This is with the children of Israel in the wilderness. And God is talking about the sacrifices that the children of Israel are to offer him. Exodus 29 and verse 18. He says, You shall offer up in smoke the whole ram on the altar. It is a bird's offering to the Lord. It is a soothing aroma. An offering by fire to the Lord. And that idea of a soothing aroma, it doesn't mean that, hey, when you do this, it's going to smell pretty good, right? That's not what it means. What does that mean? It's soothing to God. It's going to be soothing to God, right? That means when you offer this sacrifice to me, it is going to be pleasant to me. It is going to be pleasing to me. It is going to be acceptable to me, right? And so he says, this is the way you're supposed to worship. When you worship the way that I tell you to... I'll be pleased with you. It's going to be like smelling a really good candle. Rob gave me a candle in my office that I always burn, and I always think about him whenever I turn that thing on. But it's a soothing, soothing candle, and I love that smell when I come into my office. Even though Leah told me I'm not allowed to, I'm not allowed to light a match, and so she got me a candle warmer that burns it. It's not the same. It's not the same. <laughs> but that's what it is. When we offer God worship like that, He is pleased with us. 
Now, for contrast, look in the book of Malachi. It's the last book of your Old Testament. It's the book right before Matthew. And there we have a very famous example of, of worship that is displeasing to God, worship that he abhors. And these are just examples. There are many other examples we could give. I'm not giving you an exhaustive list, but I'm just walking you through. But listen to what he says here. He says in verse 7, Malachi 1 and verse 7, You are presenting defiled food upon my altar, but you say, How have we defiled you? In that you say, The table of the Lord is to be despised. But when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you present the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased with you? Or would he receive you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? But now, will you not entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us? With such an offering on your part, will he receive any of you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the gates, that you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from you. And so there you have a pretty extreme example where God looks at the way they're worshiping and he says, this is what I want you to do. What's he telling me he wants them to do? Without blemish and perfect sacrifices. Yeah, yeah, but because they're not offering that, what's he tell them to do? Shut the doors so you can do it. I would rather you not even come into the temple and try if you're not going to do it right. That's how serious God is about this. Oh, that there were one among you that would shut the gates so that you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. He doesn't say, you know, I would prefer if it were perfect and, and, and a firstborn. I would prefer if it were not lame and defective. But, you know, at least you're doing something. He doesn't say that. He says, I'd rather you offer me nothing than to worship me in the wrong way. And so to answer the question, does God care how we worship Absolutely he does. Absolutely he does. And ultimately there are two things that determine, two very general things that determine whether or not our worship is going to be pleasing or displeasing to God. And we see those drawn out by Jesus in John chapter 4. In John chapter 4 when he's talking to the woman at the well, you'll remember that she asks him a question about what? Yes, because she's a Samaritan, and for, for a good bit of time, the Samaritans had been worshiping on this mountain at these, uh, these, these temples in Samaria, and she had had a debate with the Jews, right? They had that controversy where they were, they were disputing over which mountain they were supposed to worship on. Are we supposed to go to the temple in Jerusalem, or are we supposed to worship here in Samaria? And so, she says in verse 20, Our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. They're arguing over where the acceptable place to worship is. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so those two categories help us see what God wants from us. He wants us to worship him in spirit. What does that mean? With our whole heart, our whole being. I think that's right. He wants us to have the right attitude. He doesn't just, don't just want us to come and mouth the words and not really think about what we're saying or what we're doing. He wants us to understand we are truly worshiping him and to give him all of ourselves as we, as we do that. But he says also they're going to worship in spirit. They're also going to worship in what? What does that mean? Thus saith the Lord. According to what is right. According to the commands that I have given you. Which helps to answer the question that she's asking. Our fathers worshipped on this mount. You people say we're supposed to worship in Jerusalem. But what are, where are the people supposed to worship? In Jerusalem. That's the right answer. That's the way it's supposed to be. And so understand that God does care how we worship. Quick example of that uh, that you might want to note down. We won't go there and read it. But one of the textbook examples that shows us just how much God cares about we, how we worship is Nadab and Abihu, right? That's in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, where those two priests, Nadab and Abihu, they offer something that's called strange fire. And 
That word basically means foreign or alien. And it doesn't mean that it was some kind of witchcraft. Mm -hmm. What it simply means is they offered God fire that he had not commanded them to give. That's basically what it means. And the story in the Bible tells us that fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them there. If I were writing the Bible, I would not write that story into it. Would you? But it's in there. They worship God in the wrong way. And for that, for that, they were consumed by fire. And so, does God care how we worship? Yes. Absolutely he does. And we need to understand this as well, which I don't think we always understand. What, who is worship about? When we go into the auditorium and we start singing to God, who's that really about? It's about God. And when we sit back and we say, well... I'd like to worship with an instrument because it sounds better or because it gives me all the feelings and because it really gets, gets me pumped up. What are we missing? We're trying to do it for him, not for God, yeah. not for ourselves. Yeah, we're trying to do something that's pleasing to God, not something that's pleasing to us. Now, hopefully, it'll do both. <laughs> but that's what our prime objective needs to be. I'm going to give something to God that's a soothing aroma to him. I'm not just trying to give some, get, do something that entertains me or pleases me or is pleasant to my ear. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. The second question we have to ask ourselves, obviously God does care how we worship. second question is, has God said anything to Christians about using instruments? Now, listen to that question carefully because I know where we're going. You guys, you guys know where we're going with this. Has God said anything to Christians about using instruments? Yes or no? Yes. Yes? Why do you say yes, Carl? Because it's true. He's blowing up my class. <laughs> well, it depends on what you mean by instrument. Because uh, if you refer to the actual scripture you talk about, the instruments are hard. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in that, in that sense, I say, You're going to make me go to the old faithful phrase, using mechanical instruments of music, right? <laughs> no, no. Yes. And, and that, is, that is an important point. That when you read the scriptures and you talk about the instrument that you're playing to worship God, it's talking about your heart, it's talking about your voice, it's talking about the instrument that he built into you, Right? He built this instrument into you so that you could use your voice to praise him from the, from, the, from the very roots of your creation, not from some mechanical instrument. But the answer, when you, when you break it down to say mechanical instruments of music, uh, no, he has not said anything to Christians about worshiping with mechanical instruments, has he? You read all the way up and down through the New Testament, and you don't see an example of that. We read Acts chapter 16 to begin because, surprisingly enough, that is the only reference I could find in the book of Acts, Carrie, correct me if I'm wrong, that references how we worship God with music, right? Couldn't find any other reference in the entire book of Acts about how you worship God with music other than they were sitting in a prison cell, they were singing praise to God, they were praying to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Listen to some other verses in your New Testament. Go to the book of Ephesians. I want you to see what the book of Ephesians says about this. Some other passages that tell Christians how they worship God musically. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19. <coughs> there Paul writes that we are to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. And so there you have kind of that, that using your heart as an instrument imagery, right? He says you're supposed to make melody in your heart to the Lord, but very clearly what's he talking about there? How do we worship God musically? With our voices, right? With the songs that we sing, with words that we use. We see this again in Colossians. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. Turn over there with me. It's not very far away. Colossians 3 and verse 16. 
There the Bible says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And so again, when the Bible writers tell us how we're supposed to worship God, what do they tell us to do? They tell us to sing. They tell us to use our voice. Now, both of those passages, two very famous passages that we use a lot when it comes to how we worship God, both of them use a specific word. They use the word teaching. Teaching and admonishing one another. Why would it use that word? Why would he use that word? Well, songs are repetitious. And if you sing them over and over, you've learned a lesson. That's it. Well, that's exactly right. And, and the fact that we're singing is different than just playing the piano, right? What does a song that is sung have over a song that's just played on the piano? Words. 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 Ideas. Thoughts. It was interesting. This happened to me the other day. I was... Uh, I was in my office, I was listening to Pandora Radio, and I play this, this uh, non-lyrical piano stuff, because that's the only thing I can listen to while I work, because words just take my mind into another place. And so I'm listening to this song, I'm like, this is a great song, you know, it's really wonderful, and it's got no words, it's just got notes. And then I go home, and Leah said, Jonathan, I want you to hear this new song that, uh, it's a great spiritual song, it's got wonderful ideas and wonderful words. And she plays the exact song that I just listened to, sang a cappella, right? And I'm like, I've heard that before, but I don't remember where. <laughs> and so you realize, I'm sitting in my office, all I'm thinking is, this is really beautiful. But then, when I listen to it sung without instruments, and I hear the lyrics, I realize there's thought and meaning and ideas that are being communicated there. And we're going to get and talk about the why a little bit later, but just to give you a sneak peek, that's what singing has over instruments. I can get in here and I can play my saxophone. It's not going to sound very good because it's out of tune and I haven't played for seven years and my lips are not strong like they used to be. But I could do it. But you wouldn't learn anything from me playing my saxophone, would you? They're just tones. But when I sing a song to you, it teaches you, it admonishes you. Just like we sang this morning before Don's lesson. Thou, O God, are a shield about me. You are my glory. You're the lifter of my head. That has meaning when you speak the words. It doesn't have meaning when you just hear notes. And so that is, that is something important there. There are other passages that talk about this. If you go back to 1 Corinthians 14, you'll see some references to the idea that we sing songs and we bring hymns to worship with us. In Hebrews 13 and verse 15, it says we're to offer God the fruit of our lips. Hebrews 13 and verse 15. I'm not quite sure. If that's exactly talking about using musical instruments in worship or not, but, uh, but you might want to reference that one as well. And so understand that when God, is talk when God talks to his Christians, he tells us very clearly to do one thing when it comes to worshiping him musically. He tells us to sing. He doesn't tell us, he doesn't tell us to do anything else. Now that may seem odd, seem odd to us. Because lots of people use music to worship God, but at the end of the day, that's all he really has asked for. It goes back to the question we began, began with. Why is this peculiar, peculiar? Why is this odd? And the answer is, it's definitely not odd because of anything we read in our Bibles. Right? It's odd because of what we see. It's odd because of the YouTube videos we see or the music we listen to on Spotify or Pandora. It's not odd considering what we read in the actual words of God. And that's an important consideration to think about. And so, has he said anything to Christians about musical instruments? I don't believe, I don't believe that he has. I may stand corrected on that if you find a surprise New Testament verse for me. I challenge you to find that. I haven't found it yet. Third question is, well, is that really even a big deal? Sure, he's asked us to sing, but why can't we just go ahead and use musical instruments anyway? I mean, how about this? How about this? We'll sing and use musical instruments. That's what everybody does anyway. So what's the answer to that? Should we go ahead and use musical instruments anyway in the worship of God? What do you say? Yeah. 
<laughs> somebody says no. That's the Bible class answer. Maybe there's somebody in here thinking, I know I'm supposed to say no, and I know everybody else is going to say no, but I'm not sure I'm convinced. I want you to see a story for me with me in, in 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7, there are a couple different passages we could go to to make this point, but I think this passage, this story, makes the point pretty clearly. God cares how we worship. He hasn't told Christians to use instruments. Should we use them anyway? Here's a great story to answer that question. 2 Samuel 7 and verse 1. Now it came about when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest on every side from all his enemies, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within ten curtains. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that's in your mind, for the Lord is with you. But in the same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go, and say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one who should build me a house to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt, even to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent, even in a tabernacle. Wherever I, wherever I have gone with all the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel, which I commanded to shepherd by people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? So what you have in that story is you have King David sitting in his house, peace is on all sides, and he has a great idea in his heart, right? The idea is, I should do something wonderful for God. And so let's acknowledge from the very beginning, how's his heart in this? How's his attitude? Perfect. Better than mine, right? And probably better than yours, because a bunch of us sat around on Sunday afternoon, and we didn't sit around and say, how should I use these four hours for God, right? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but he's sitting there thinking, I should do something for God because I have time and I have opportunity and I have ability. And so he says, I'm going to build God a temple. And the prophet, without actually consulting God, says, yeah, go ahead. That sounds great. Do it. And then that night, the Lord comes to that prophet and basically asks David one simple question. You see at the end of verse 7, when have I ever said, I want you to build me a house? What's the implication of that story? You don't do it unless I ask you to. You don't do it unless I ask you to. And, and, and maybe another point, right? If I wanted it, what? I would have told you. I would have asked for it. That's the, that's the thing about God. We think we're giving him some, oh God, you, you, just, you were just asking for songs, but guess what? I've got something better for you, right? Here we go. We think that we're doing a one-up on God, and we think that we're doing something better. We think we're adding whipped cream and sprinkles to the Sunday. But God says, look, if I wanted it, I would have asked for it. And that's true even for David, who really wants to serve God, has wonderful intentions, and has a pure heart. That's something that I think, I think it's important for me to understand. Maybe you think that's important for you to understand. People... People who worship God with instruments are not people who have bad intentions. They're not carnal and ungodly and just want to do what makes them happy. That's not true. Lots of them have good intentions and pure hearts who really want to worship God. But they just haven't yet learned the lesson of 2 Samuel 7 and verse 7. That when God really wants something from us, he'll ask for it. And that we should only give God in worship the things that he has asked for. So, does God care how we worship? Yes. Has God said anything to us about using instruments? No. Should we go ahead and worship with them anyway? I think the answer to that question is no as well. And those three questions really form the foundation of, of why I believe it's right to worship the way that we worship. Of course, there are a couple of questions, objections that might be raised in, in light of all of that. And, and one of them has to do with what Guthrie said at the beginning. Some people look at instruments and say, look, God was okay with them in the Old Testament. Why is he not okay with them in the New Testament? What would you say to that? There's a lot of things they did in the Old Testament. We don't do, we don't, um, yeah, we don't have animals here Sunday. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Do you think God wants us to kill goats on the stage on Sunday morning? 
What we forget also is that what we read in the Old Testament, the law of Moses, is not the law that was given to the entire world. It was given to one specific special people for one specific period of time. Let us never make the mistake of thinking that we are those people, right? Because we don't teach animal sacrifice. We don't practice animal sacrifice. We don't preach that you have to be circumcised to go to heaven, do we? And not to mention the fact that under the law of Moses, there were people who were saved because they obeyed God, but no one commanded them to be baptized. Are we going to sit back and say, well, I guess baptism isn't important? Different law, different people. And so Christians need to listen to what has been said to Christians under Christ, not what Moses said to Israelites. We're not Israelites, and we're not under the law of Moses anymore. Was somebody going to say something? I thought I saw a hand raised. Well, yes, sir. My, I was thinking the Old Testament was very outward sacrifice, like you mentioned. The New Testament is more focused on the inner, the heart. So it makes sense that we sing you know, from ourselves, our heart, our, our spirit, rather than playing something that's outside the body. Um, that's how I kind of look at it, between the two, the old and the new. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, we'll get to that a little bit more in a, in a second, but I think you're absolutely right about that. It's about what's inside and not as much about what's outside. The other thing that I think we fail to realize about how the Israelites use instruments is that they didn't just do it willy-nilly. right? They didn't just say, oh, it's time to worship God. Let me go get my saxophone. Let me go get my guitar. They didn't do it that way. If you read, write this down, read it, because we don't have time right now. You can read it later. 2 Chronicles 29, 25 through 30 is one instance where King Hezekiah brings back the worship of God, including worshiping God with instruments. When you read that story, something becomes very clear, that their worship is very organized. It is not willy-nilly. It's not just everybody running around worshiping God with instruments however they want to. They worship with God exactly as Gad, the prophet, the king, seer, instructed them to worship. And so they worship God with instruments, with specific kinds of instruments, at specific times, in specific places, because they were following the specific instructions they were given. And so let us not think that God was just, well, I'm fine with that in the Old Testament, but I'm not fine with it here. They did it because they received specific instructions to do it. Not just because God was willy-nilly with them in old times. Uh, that same Chronicles 29, 25 through 30. You can go ahead and read that story. It's very informative and important. Now, one of the other questions, one of the other objections that have been raved, raised, raved, <laughs> maybe raved, I don't know. Uh, have you ever heard this one? Some people says, well, you don't see them use instruments in the book of Acts because they couldn't afford it. Anybody heard that? Anybody heard that before? So what would you say to that? Well, we would see instruments if they were wealthy. What would you say? You don't even know how to answer, Shannon. No. She's just... <laughs> I don't remember there being a list of everybody's financial status that was converted. You missed that? I did, yeah. <laughs> Did they not cover that at FC? I guess not. Oh, man. At least not the first year. <laughs> oh, man. How about, how about Acts chapter 4, where somebody literally takes a plot of land and sells it? Right? If you can afford to sell land to give to charity, don't you think you probably have enough money to afford an instrument? I, I, this idea that we just, they're all poor, they're all destitute, nobody has any means, that could be further from the truth. We see examples that people were wealthy, people had means, people had the ability to do things. What was Cornelius? He was a centurion. I think he probably, I think he probably did okay. Some people were poor, some people were rich. But the idea that nobody could afford an instrument is just, is just kind of silly. They didn't have pianos. They didn't have pianos. They didn't have pianos. Then. But once the piano came, <laughs> that which is in part can be done away. Right? But that raises the real, the real question that I think ought to be dealt with. And, and, and I think it's a very important question to answer. The question is why? You know, and that really is the main thing. God was cool with it in the Old Testament. You saw that. So why? Why is he not cool with it now? What would you say? His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. All right, so John's going with old faithful. I don't know, but God said it. Which is the best answer, right? It's the best answer. 
Uh, yes, that is true. And anything we do beyond this point is pure conjecture, right? So that is true. This is clearly the case, all right? And so we need to we need to appreciate that. But why? Why do you think? I'll give you a little conjecture. Not everybody can play an instrument. Everybody can sing. Some people are better singers than others. That's not really the point either. Yeah. Everybody can participate in that and, and, and benefit from it. Yeah, and that's exactly right. That goes with one of the things, one of the reasons why I think this, this is different is because God has always sought to make worship simple so that everybody can do it. You think about what we do, it's not very complicated. The most complicated thing we have to do is probably find grape juice somewhere and have enough water to submerge a person. Beyond that, it's really simple. And so what God has done with worship is he made it possible so that we can do it here in opulent America, but also they can do it in the sticks in Zimbabwe. Worship is simple, and it's simple for a reason. Um, and also, not every church's band sounds like Lily Giglio's band in Atlanta, okay? There are lots of people trying to worship with instruments and lots of church bands that don't sound great at all. That might actually be more distracting than helpful. Right? Not everything is a production like that. Maybe that's, maybe that's a cheap shot. I don't know. Let me give you a couple things because we're running out of time. There, here are a couple arguments that I've seen used for why things change. The first view is that God eliminated instruments from the worship of his church because they were connected with idolatry, and he did not want his people to be mistaken for pagans. You ever thought about that? That was actually a view that was held by Martin Luther. Um, and so he thought that instruments were wrong because it would connect you to paganism. Stay here, stay here. <laughs> uh, another view is that God eliminated instruments because they were connected to Judaism. And so one of the ways he wanted to separate them from that dying away religion was to say, okay, you're not going to worship with instruments anymore. It's another possibility. The possibility that I stick with more than anything else is that God eliminated instruments because singing is a more meaningful spiritual activity. When we sing, we speak truth from the heart. We communicate deep truths for, uh, for God and about God. We don't just make melody as an instrument does. We make melody with our hearts. And we communicate those truth, truths to our church family. We communicate those truths to members. We are teaching and learning and growing when we sing. We're not just listening to music. Singing is a much more spiritually rich activity than merely playing an instrument. And singing is something that everybody can do. It's something that everybody is involved in. And that's something important for everybody here to recognize. Because we may, we may sit here and say, well, we, uh, we don't use instruments. But if you go out there in the auditorium and you sit there silently and don't sing, don't think that you're off the hook. Because God wants you to worship him. And that's why we sing. Because he wants everyone to worship him. All right. Go. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hey y'all. I thought the y'all. Uh, you know how the one lady is like, don't tell me you need every Sunday because more like dollars. That's not just like the occasional. I thought that related to music instruments where it means more to me than it is to God. Yeah, that's all I can do. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate you know what else that. I thought? There's too many instances where people took it upon themselves hey, to speak to God. They said, God said, you know, just pay that price for doing what you want to do instead of what I've told you to do. I think that's something that really you know that? You know, we ought to think about. Uh, we start adding to what the consequence is going to be. It's important to keep that in mind. But yeah, I, I think you're right. I think you're right.